Hi, everyone. Welcome in. Thank you for tuning in. Happy Friday. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with Pamela Painter discussing her latest book, Fabrications, New and Selected Stories. She is joined tonight in conversation by Steve Yarbrough. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our new digital community during these challenging times. Our spring season is ramping up, so make sure to check our event schedule on harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get there as many as time allows. If you would like to purchase a copy of Fabrications, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you would like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in in support of authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these past many months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. So thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And finally, I just wanted to say sincerely, it's been a tough week. If you are here tonight, and if you are feeling overwhelmed by the events that have happened in our nation, let me invite you to take a rest in this book talk. For now, let's all just take a small break. We deserve to enjoy a discussion that is filled with both intelligence and beauty. I think we could all use a little bit of that. And on that note, I am so excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Pamela Painter is the author of four short story collections, The Long and Short of It, Wouldn't You Like to Know, Ways to Spend the Night, and Getting to Know the Weather. Her work has been widely published in publications such as The Atlantic, Harper's, The Kenyan Review, Plowshares, and many more. She currently teaches creative writing at Emerson College. And she is joined tonight by Steve Yarbrough, who also teaches creative writing at Emerson. He had the pleasure of being my professor. He is the author of 11 books, most recently the novel, The Unmade World. His other end books include the nonfiction title, Bookmarked, Larry Murthy, McMurthy's The Last Picture Show, the novels The Realm of Last Chances, Safe from the Neighbors, and The End of California. Tonight, they are discussing Pam's new book, Fabrications. It is a remarkable collection of stories filled with characters whose intense desires bring disaster. With brand new stories, as well as some of her fantastic work from the past, it is a beautiful collection. The ever-lovely Margaret Livesey said about it, these wonderful stories vividly demonstrate Painter's wicked intelligence and ruthless humor and her utterly democratic interest in all of our faults and foibles. A quirky, sexy, irresistible collection. And then on that note of high praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Pam, Steve, thank you so much for being here. The virtual podium is yours. Greetings. Am I on? <laughs> you are on. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Audrey, and thank you to Harvard Bookstore. I am so glad that we were able to move this from really a chaotic Wednesday to tonight. And um, thank you for everyone who has made the jump. And um, I don't know, I feel like a CNN watcher. I can probably uh, quote people, but Anyway, I'm so delighted to be here and to be in conversation with Steve. And um, I'm actually going to read a story first and um, we'll see uh, how generous I am to my characters. Anyway, it's a story called Doors. So uh, starting out, male narrator. Okay, his wife had closed another door. It must have happened while he was taking his afternoon nap. All fall as the days nipped into dusk at an earlier hour, throwing shadows deep into the long second floor hallway, Franklin had walked past the closed doors without really thinking about them, without thinking closed, until today when he noticed that the light in the hallway had changed once again 
that there was less of it. Now, of all the various bedrooms, adjacent bathrooms, etc., and his wife's sewing room was the only room whose doors were still open. Tonight, his wife was out meeting with the library board to plan the town's Halloween events. Children are so difficult to scare these days, she said as she was leaving. They think ghosts retired with the horse and buggy. How about slipping a few sinister elements into the school's drinking water, he joked, anxious for her to go so he could snoop around the house. When he was sure that she wouldn't return for some forgotten item, he'd climb the stairs to the second floor, followed by a panting Zeus, their aging setter. The doors, tall and narrow, with molded panels and faceted glass doorknobs, had particularly pleased his wife when they were looking for a house 30 years ago. Tentatively, he put his hand in the cool glass knob of the first door his wife had closed, their oldest daughter's room with a pink ribbon wallpaper and a pink vanity table. He turned the knob. When the door didn't yield, he twisted it back and forth, then rattled it. Surely it couldn't be locked. He gripped the doorknob harder and pushed against it with his shoulder as Zeus looked on in bored disbelief. Six months ago, when his wife had closed the first door, Zeus lay on the carpet outside, his scraggly head between his paws, mournful and whined all night. Just let him in for a minute, he said, so we can see that Franny isn't there, Franklin said. Oh, I don't want to do that, his wife had said. He'll just have to learn that room isn't there. Well, Franklin thought, we'll see about that. Except clearly the door was locked. This possibility had never occurred to him. He hadn't even known the bedroom doors had locks, though, of course, that special sharp waisted opening beneath the knob was a keyhole. Where was the key? Ever since their youngest daughter had married, he talked of moving to a smaller house, less yard to mow and protect from moles, closer to his work. Leave, leave our home, his wife said, the first time he brought it up. He had tracked her down in the kitchen where she was drying herbs. How could you ever think of leaving our garden, selling this house? Perhaps his response, that he could leave it quite easily and that maybe he'd call in a real estate agent for an estimate had been a bit hasty. She'd gone on to say that they'd reared their three children here, that four cats, three dogs, and two gerbils were buried in the field beyond the barn, and that her greenhouse was a second home. Impatiently, he waited several months before he asked the realtor to stop by. You have a gem of a gold mine here, the realtor said, his small eyes promising huge profits he would no doubt share. We'll let you know, his wife said, ushering the realtor and his paperwork toward the door. When he had gone, she turned to Franklin. Gold mine? The next day, she closed the first door and announced at dinner. I've closed the door to Polly's room. Don't go in there anymore, you'll see. Pretty soon, the house will seem smaller. A month later, he brought home spec sheets for the apartment in the new block of condominiums near his lab. The next day, she closed the second door. It won't just seem smaller, she said, it is smaller. When the realtor returned with two eager colleagues, his wife retreated to the greenhouse till they were gone. And then she set about cleaning out the attic. She hired the teenage son of the neighbor and together they packed boxes and sent it all off to Goodwill. Franklin took it as a hopeful sign that she'd come round to his point of view. But when the last box was disposed of, she merely firmly closed the attic door. Looking back, he suspected she'd emptied out the attic so she close, could close that door too. Now, with Zeus padding behind him, he moved to the second door. The room belonged to their absent son, who collected posters of the world's tallest buildings, drawings of the most improbable bridges. He tried the knob, locked too. He moved along the hallway, surprised to find the door to their younger daughter's bedroom was also locked. Its shelves of delicate music boxes now silent and still. His wife used to go in there of an evening and set two or three music boxes to going. They miss singing, she'd say. Once again, he gripped the glass knob of his daughter's room and he tried in vain to force the lock, an old fashioned cast iron rectangle. He kicked the bottom panel hard. A slight tinkling came from inside the room, then silence. Be damned. Another kick to the door sent Zeus panting to the top of the stairs clearly hoping the fuss would not flush a rabbit he'd be obliged to track. Frustrated, Franklin nudged the door down the stairs ahead of him and waited for his wife in the study. Damn it, this was his house. He'd never liked closed doors anyway, 
He could vaguely remember as a child of three or four, watching his parents open the front door and disappear into the dark night. For an evening out, his mother would say, waving cheerily to Franklin and the sitter. Then she'd pull shut the door. For years, he thought that out meant they were just outside in the porch on the other side of the door, breathing quietly until Wim would bring them back long after he'd cried himself to sleep. He must have dozed off because he woke with a start at hearing his wife's merry voice in the entranceway. Soon she set the tea kettle on and then looked into the study where he'd been working with the Times Daily Crossword. Tea, Franklin, she asked brightly. The library is almost ready for Halloween. Just a bit more atmosphere, cobwebs, lights in the stacks, the carols closed off into tiny hidden rooms. The kids will love it. Locked, Franklin croaked, his jaw so locked itself that it was all he could manage to say. Ah, oh, the door, she said, scratching the goose behind the ears. Why, why did you lock the doors? She looked up in genuine surprise. So you wouldn't open them. Why shouldn't I open them, he said. But you want a smaller house, Franklin. How can I make the house smaller if you insist on keeping it larger? How had the children survived her logic? There are only a few condominiums left, he said. I'm stopping by for four floor plans tomorrow. The tea kettle began to whistle. Oh dear, she said, patting Zeus's head and rising. Please, Franklin, just give us a little more time. Please, he said, throwing the uncooperative crossword into the fire. Don't be so melodramatic. You're merely downscaling our living arrangements. The next day, unbelievably, the door to her sewing room was closed. The place where she'd sewn curtains for the 44 windows he cursed each spring and fall as he prepared to put up or take down the summer screens. Wisely, he had hired someone to do the job the last 10 years. This fall, as he'd followed the hired man around from window to window, calling instructions from the bottom of the long aluminum ladder, the task, oddly, had seemed to take less time. But her sewing room, how could she abandon it? Now, only their bedroom was left. He felt so queasy that it took him five minutes to find the right kind of chisel to open such locks. Zeus lumbered after him to the basement and then back upstairs to the sewing room where Franklin knelt in front of the door. He imagined dust settling on the long oak table where she cut out patterns and on the white cloth torso of the wire mannequin she fitted and pinned the fabric to. Years ago, he had had erotic dreams about that shapely padded torso. And now it was as if he were going to visit a woman he'd once flirted with at a party. When was the last time his wife had sewed something for their home? Finally, the door swung open. Still on his knees, he had to grip the door frame to keep from falling into the night. Zeus whimpered at his side. The room was gone. There was at least a 20-foot sheer drop to the lawn below. Franklin could smell the fertilizer from the back paddock and the harvest moon showed golden on the horizon. Breathless, he pulled closed the door and leaned against the wall. It couldn't be. When he recovered, he set the chisel against the lock on the attic door. The attic too was gone. Where there had once been a steep curving staircase, the door to the attic now opened onto a view of his wife's slumbering greenhouse in the yard. Frantically, he peered around for something, anything to throw, th throw through the open doorway. Zeus obliged by dropping a slobbery fake bone at his feet. He held Zeus tightly by the collar and threw the bone glistening out into the night where it landed with a soft plop on the wet grass, real grass. He put new batteries in the flashlight, pulled on a heavy sweater and went outside, feeling oddly safer there. Cricket sawed in the dewy grass. A coyote howled a mating call. Slowly, Franklin prowled the perimeter of the house, locating each child's bedroom, the corner windows of his wife's sewing room. The, house, the house's dimensions were unchanged. Where's your bone, he whispered to Zeus, and stood there shivering in the cool night while Zeus reluctantly zigzagged back and forth, sniffing the wet grass. Find your bone, he called again. But Zeus returned without a tail drooping. What are you good for, Franklin said, that after five minutes of pacing back and forth, he too failed to find the bone. A cloud passed over the moon and Franklin gave up. He didn't know if he was more frightened 
for relieved. On the way back to the house, he stopped by the car for the condominium plans. He had been patient long enough. In wide swipes, he opened the rolled pages on the long table in his study and secured the corners with heavy books. They glowed invitingly in the dim light of the moon. Zeus came by to slobber over them and Franklin pushed him away. He knew exactly which ap apartment he wanted, four rooms with a generous storage room in the basement. Bringing the plans home for his wife's approval was only a formality. They'd move sometime after the new year. Sad, the condominium rules decreed that Zeus would not be able to make the move with them. Franklin sat in the deep shadows of the corner near the fireplace in his old leather chair and waited, his eyes on the door, too angry to turn on the light. About 10, he heard his wife's foolish murmuring in the hall, then her solid footsteps in the kitchen tiles where she set the tea kettle to boil. Finally, she retraced her steps down the hallway and entered the study, squinting into the dim light. Zeus stood and stretched, and when she said his name, he padded over to her, his tail swishing, loyal and low. Franklin smiled furtively to himself. Let her turn on the light. Let her find the plans for herself. The room remained dark. Zeus padded past Franklin's wife out into the hall. And after a moment's hesitation, she followed him. Seemingly as an afterthought, she turned and closed the door and then she locked it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that was a lovely story. One, one of my favorite in the book. Um, and of course I have many favorites. I just want to make an observation. Um, and that is how beautifully you use Zeus in this story. And a second observation, one of the people who I think is um, with us here tonight um, said something to me the other day in an email um, about just how vivid the descriptions are in your work. And, you know, I can point to no better line than Zeus stood and noisily stretched. When he said his name, he ambled over to her. That's where most writers, lesser writers, are going to end the sentence. And then here's the gold. His tail swishing, loyal and low. <laughs> Do those lines come easily to you? Or is that one that you would possibly have had to linger over? Oh, I'm going to say, they just come. I wouldn't say easily, but I do care about language and I like to extend things a little. Um, so I extended his tail, <laughs> low, low, and low. And with it, he became even more of a, a memorable character in the story. And it's so often true in lines like those in your stories. Um, you and I have talked about this before, but I, I think this is a good place to start the conversation. You write a lot of male characters, and you write them frequently from the inside. And um, I think you and I both know that a lot of people find it very difficult to get outside the box of their own gender. Um, why have you so, so often felt that you could easily write these male characters and done it so brilliantly? Well, at, at first I felt forced to. In my first marriage, which was a terrible marriage, my husband didn't want to read any stories at all from an unhappy housewife, me. <laughs> so, so I thought, I, I can't write those stories. So I started writing stories from a male point of view. I wrote a story from the point of view of a drummer, a mailman, and those men just came easily to me. Um, and they still do. Uh, a story I wrote about a, a Las Vegas wedding recently has a male point of view. But, uh, and, then, and then I did, after my divorce, <laughs> I wrote quite a few stories from a female point of view. And then I felt so sorry for my ex-husband that I went back and wrote another story from his point of view. But um, the male point of view, it just comes easily to me now. Okay. Um, 
What takes you into a story? Is it a is it a conception of the character? Is it a situation? Is it imagery? What draws you on? Oh, it's it's always different. Um, I, I was thinking about this story. I have no idea where it came from, except when I leave my apartment, I, I think my cat must wonder where I'm going. And she sometimes gets into the hallway and must think, what the hell is this? You know, she just goes into the hallway and I, I picture my cat thinking I'm on the other side of the door. That's, that's where a kernel of an idea comes from. Um, I met a drummer and he told me he met Buddy Rich and he was just really you know, shy about meeting Buddy Rich. And he told me the story. And, and, and so I wrote a story the next time I meet Buddy Rich. And then I actually went to meet him. Stories come from everywhere. Sometimes a student will tell me a story and I'll say, like I said, oh, Jason, that is a fabulous story idea. And he'd say, you can have it. <laughs> and so I used it. He was a bartender and he, he told me a story about one night when it was just really wild and people would go into the ladies room and the men's room, you know, sometimes they'd do drugs and sometimes they'd have sex. So on a really wild night loud, he took a wedge. And when a couple went into the men's room, he wedged the door shut. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved that. And how many divorces did that lead to? <laughs> well, he didn't, he didn't write that story. And I didn't write it from male point of view. I wrote it from one, a bar back, a young woman who was working for him. And that was, that was, I think, the first or second story in an anthology called The New Micro. Story ideas just come from everywhere. My kids have given me tons of story ideas and um, I love them for it. Uh, I, had, I had one kid, my youngest son would come back from visiting his father and he'd say, mom, you have to sit down. You're not gonna believe this story. And indeed I didn't. And I wrote a story called Feeding the Piranha. <laughs> oh yeah, kids great story. Who tell their their parents what they want to hear. Yeah. Um, I have a friend and I, I think you know him fairly well yourself, the novelist and short story writer, Richard Bausch. Mm -hmm. um, and one day I was sitting here writing and I got an email from Dick and um, the email said, Steve, do you remember anything about the writing of your stories or your novels afterward? And my first thought was, well, that's a crazy question. And then my second was, no, I remember almost nothing uh, two or three weeks down the road. So I'm gonna ask you that. And, I, and it's one of the few questions I've never asked you. Do you remember? Oh, you know, I think I do. They're my children. They're, they're really like, like children to me. Um, I, I guess there are a few stories that I don't, but I put this collection together and, and there's like another ghost collection that's trailing along that, that isn't in this collection. And uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I love my stories, <laughs> I love my children. We have to love our work, don't we? We do. Um, and, you know, there aren't that many writers out there who are going to ever get to do what you've done with this particular collection, because this collection is a new and selected. And it really, there's a, there's a section of brand new stories, um, quite a few of them. But it spans your entire short story writing career. And, I mean, I can think of some great stories of yours that I know did not make it in here because there just wasn't room for them. Can you say something about how you went about choosing the ones that would stay and, and organizing this collection? Yeah, um, I, I, I put my stories onto little cards and laid the, laid the cards out on a table like little slips like that. And then I just thought, okay, this is a female point of view, a male point of view. These are things from say, Painter Town. Uh, these are by my children. Uh, these stories have to do with an unhappy housewife. These have to have stories have to do with, you know, murder. 
<laughs> and mayhem. And, and then I just started moving them around. Um, this story was really, really short. I didn't want to include too many short stories, but, but it was a matter of really shaping the collection. I didn't have a, a lot of time to do it, um, but it, it took a lot of work. It, it really did. And again, the, some of the things I've left out, oh, they call to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you just mentioned Painter Town. Mm. And um, when I first met you, uh, what, 2009, you gave a party for me. And I walked through Back Bay to this quite imposing brownstone. And I thought, oh, well, that tells me a lot about her. Here's, a, here's an affluent Bostonian who's, you know, been living it up here. And I found out that your background is very, very different from your current reality. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about Painter Town. Uh, Painter Town. You know, I think my first stories came from that locale. Um, I didn't live in Painter Town, but, but my parents both grew up in Painter Town. Painter Town was not a town, it was the side of a hill that had a gas station that sold bread and eggs and a fire hall called Far Hall. And we went there every weekend. On Friday, we got in the car, and on Sunday night, we came home. I mean, that's why I never smoked, because my parents would both smoke in the car. Anyway, that's an aside. So, so my first stories were were from Painter Town. My parents never went past eighth grade, and I, of course, went on to college. I mean, I can remember when you had chamber pots in the eaves, and uh, we were thrilled when plumbing happened. My grandmother made bread every day. But I grew up, and uh, you know, and, and my parents had ambitions for me. For example, I had violin lessons and baton lessons, <laughs> and in their minds, they were the same thing. <laughs> One of my cousins in Painter Town was a drum majorette. So, uh, you know, but, but throughout all that, uh, I, my uncle in Painter Town, who came back from the war, he read paperbacks, uh, paperbacks like cowboy paperbacks, and they were lined up in his bedroom. And, and when I had to take a nap, I, I, I would read those paperbacks. So, Painter Town was just very, very real to me. And it was in, and, and as a young girl, maybe I longed for a canopy bed because my first collection, I didn't even know this, had three canopy beds in the stories. Three, I've never had a canopy bed. And then I was looking at, at my latest stories and by God, there's a canopy bed again. I don't know where they, where do details come from? They're gifts from the gods. So, so you, don't, you don't regard having grown up there um, as something that got in the way of your being a writer. Oh, not at all. No, it, it's part of my life. I, it, it gave me a lot of the stories. My first published stories came out of there, quilting parties. Um, a story that I wrote in grad school close to home was just straight painter town and uh, George Garrett chose it as the title for the collection that year, close to home. But that's not in my collection. It's just, yeah. You know, well, I know about. You know something I, I don't know. I, I guess it's one of the few things I've never asked you. Is, were your parents still alive when you began to publish your work? No, no. Okay. Yeah, um, they were. My mother was alive when I wrote my first and second stories, and. Um, but she never saw my work published. No. How do you think they would have? How do you think they would have reacted to the Painter Town stories? Oh, I think they would have been shocked by them. They would have been shocked <laughs> at what I didn't tell them, what <laughs> they didn't know. And um, I mean, sometimes you think about that with people you know. Well, I can relate to that, Pamela, because um, when my first book of stories came out. I did not understand that it would be available in bookstores um, earlier than the pub day. You know, that was the way things worked back then. And so one day I'm trying to decide how I'm going to break the news of this to my father. Uh, I get a phone call from my mother and they've seen it at a store and they bought it. And he's read the first story um, about a man who's very 
um, responsible and long suffering and misunderstood. So he has her call me and tell me how much he loves my book. And I tell my wife, Eva, if he's reading straight through in about an hour, there's going to be a terrible eruption. <laughs> so um, I don't know, have you, have you had experiences like that with other people in your life who read your work? Well, let's see. I mean, my, my youngest son thought he wore a Chicago Bears shirt. He loved the Chicago Bears. We lived in Chicago and had a larger house at that time, three stories. And he thought the laundry was done in the laundry chute. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'd say, Derek, we have to wash that shirt. And he'd say, I wash it every night. Well, he would put it in the laundry chute on the way to the third floor. And then he'd go down in the basement and get it out. Where I wrote the story, published the story, I was doing a reading and there was Derek sitting in the audience. And I came to that line and I said, oh, Derek. In the audience, he said, oh, mom. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, my daughter uh, I, is named Finney in my stories. And she wasn't too happy when I named my cat Finney. <laughs> Other people. Oh, no, I don't, I can't think of, I don't know other people yeah well um you and i have we share a wall at, at emerson college you're in the office next to mine and so um i have had the great pleasure of overhearing your tutelage of some of our students doing through the years and i think something that um is pretty well known for people who've been around you is that you are a fierce believer in revision and I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. How much of the writing of one of your stories is just getting it down on the page? How much of it is the other stuff? When I start a story, I never know the ending. I feel that the ending is a gift from the gods. And I wrote, write, I, I have an unstable situation and, and I write through it and towards something. And when I get to an ending, it really feels like a gift from the gods. I might do nine drafts, 17 drafts, and the, different, the difference between a good story and a published story is, is uh, revision. I, I really do care about revision. My students know that I, I make them revise. I used to have my workshops cut up their stories and hang them on the wall just to see how long you know, a scene might be. And we used to do that with writers' stories too. And I can remember doing uh, a James Baldwin story, Sonny's Blues. And there we had it hanging on the wall. And there was one scene that came down the wall and across the floor. And it was, it was astonishing to see that that was a scene in the past. Anyway, um, when, you, when you revise, you really know what's, what's in your work. And I, I believe in it enormously. I also believe in reading. Can you say a little bit about that? Well, when, when I was growing up, I, I was an only child for many years, and, and I, I was called, there's that Pam with her nose in a book. And, and for a while, it was those, those Westerns my uncle was reading, uh, and then it went on to Nancy Drew, Bobby Ann, if she's there, <laughs> Nancy Drew stories and the Hardy Boys. But, but reading, the, the, one of the really great things, two great things said about reading, one by Margot Livesey. One must learn to read as a writer, to search out the hidden machinery, which it is the business of art to conceal and the business of the apprentice to comprehend. That, that is so eloquent and you have to wrap your mind around it. And then another great thing is um, was something Saul Bellow said. He said, every writer is a reader moved to emulation. And, um, oh, I'm a reader. Yeah, I'm still there with my nose in a book. Maybe that's one of the reasons that this isolation of, from COVID and the pandemic, I'm okay if I have a book. I mean, I, I never go anywhere without a book. I, if I'm on the subway, anywhere, if I'm, I, if I'm stuck anywhere, I'm always afraid of getting stuck in an elevator or just stuck somewhere. And if I have a book with me, I'm okay. Or if I have pen and paper, I can remember I wrote one story 
that um, I, I had to stand in line, this is years ago, to pay my son's bill at BU. And I got in line and the man standing in line there said, at this point, it's going to be a three hour wait. And I just went batshit. I said to my son, go get me some paper and a pen. I didn't have it with me. I had my checkbook. He went and he got purple paper. It, it was, a, you know, like an ad for an archery club. And I wrote a story standing in line there. So I've written stories at, uh, at uh, swim meets and I can write anywhere and, and, and reading. Is, reading is just a way of life. It, it is. Yeah. A novelist friend of mine, I was checking in with him the other day and um, I asked him, how are you doing during the pandemic? And his response was, I've been waiting most of my life for a reason to just stay at home and read all the time. <laughs> So um, you mentioned um, paying the bill in the context of the little anecdote, and you've been a professor now for quite some time, um, but what else have you done to pay the bills? Oh, oh, I was a ghostwriter for many years, and I put three kids through college by ghostwriting. And then I wrote a story about being a ghostwriter. I mean, being a ghostwriter was just crazy. I did one with a, a criminal that was, was the largest robbery in US history at the time. I did a, a ghostwritten book with my divorce attorney. And when I was married to my new husband, this divorce attorney came and stayed with us in Boston while we finished up the book. And he referred to me as his typist. <laughs> I thought my husband was going to kill him. He said, Jim, Pamela wrote the book. So um, yeah, so, and, and then I, I got a, a National Endowment of the Arts grant one year. I was thrilled and, um, and I, I quit ghostwriting and I've never gone back, but I've gotten some stories from it. Yeah, one, a ghostwriter. I, actually, I don't think that's in my collection either, but uh, a magazine called Night Train published it. and. Uh, I did a book in Saudi Arabia, and um, I had a, a brain surgeon. He had a sentence that said something like, we opened the head in the first two hours and then blah, blah. I said, Kenyon, two hours. I said, that deserves a whole chapter where you opened the brain. Anyway, yeah. So one does what one can in order to write what one loves. Well. You've had such a distinguished career. Um, I've been reading your work for, you know, I think all the way back to grad school. And I'm wondering from this from this vantage point, I mean, obviously you're, you're writing stories all the time. They're coming out left and right in some of the best journals in the country. When you look back over your whole career, do you have any regrets? Is there anything you wish you had done differently? I wish I'd written a novel. I am so jealous. I mean, we're good friends and I hear about your novel and, and you're, you're thinking about your next novel. And I, I started a novel when I was at the writer's room. Um, I think Mary Bermina is there now. Anyway, and it, I, my husband was diagnosed with cancer and just on a dime, I never went back to the writer's room. And there was a woman there who moved all my stuff, my books, everything, notes, three times. And finally, she wrote to me and said, um, yes, because the writer's room moved. Finally, she said, I'm putting it out on my porch. And if you don't come get it, I'm putting it in the trash. So my youngest son, <laughs> of the Chicago Bears shirt, went and got it from the porch. And I never looked at it. So I'm, I'm a short story writer. That arc is is 25 pages but i'm so jealous of you all who write novels really and you write both steve but but you're not called to return you've done what three story collections and you're not really called to return to the story i find that um that writing short stories is just getting very difficult for me because um i'm used to keeping my foot on the brake for 100 pages or so because i've learned 
that if I'm not very careful and slow and meticulous at the beginning of a novel, I'm probably going to be making some bad choices. And I, I think that's made it a lot more difficult for me um, to do what you do now. Um, and certainly I, 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 would, I would love to do it if I could do it as well as you do, but I don't think I can. Um, and by the way, I, I'm afraid to give you the galley proofs to one of my novels because I, I live in fear that you're going to call me up and say, Steve, this really needs some work on it <laughs> at a point when no more work can be done. You do never ask my advice. That is true. But, <laughs> but your novels are, are wonderful. And um, yeah. Um, I don't know. It, I certainly can ask a couple more questions. I don't no, I think Audrey wanted to leave 15 or 20 minutes. Um, how are we doing, Audrey? Can I ask you that? We're doing great. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left. We got some questions. Anyone who's watching who has any questions they want to ask tonight, go to the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. But Steve, go ahead. Ask whatever questions you want. Okay. Um, well, so I guess one thing I've been um, wondering about I hear a lot of writers who do what you and I do, which is to, you know, teach younger writers and try to help them along, um, say that the that, that gets in the way of their work. And I'm just curious if you feel like that's been a detriment. I think you, you've been a professor now for, what, about 30 years or something like that. The teaching gets in the way of their work? Yeah, of your own writing. Now, I... I am so grateful for teaching because I'm going to have a detour now. I, if I hadn't been teaching, I would not be a writer. I read all through high school, all through college, you know, all through a bit of graduate school. And then I was teaching high school and I was given, um, I don't, the third year I was teaching high school, I was given a creative writing course to teach. And mm -hmm. by God, I, I told the principal, I said, I don't, know anything about creative writing. I read, but I don't know. I once wrote bad poetry, but never anymore. He said, do it, you have to do it. So, so that first night or that first day of teaching this course, we started out with fiction and they, the, the students knew more than I did because I said, okay, tonight write a story and bring it in tomorrow. And they bitched and moaned, of course. And I said, never mind, I'll do it with you. And I wrote my first two stories that semester with those high school kids in, you know, in that class. And then I thought what you do is you revise a story, you revise a story, and then you send it out, you get it published, and then you start another story. <laughs> and I, I mean, what students have today in the terms of writing programs is wonderful. Anyway, so I moved to Chicago with the three kids and um, joined a writing group. And they said, what are you talking about? No, you finish a story and you start another story. And then you keep, you keep the, the idea of sending work out over here and you keep writing over here. But, but if I hadn't been given that course, I mean, talk about you know, roads diverging. If I hadn't been given that course when I was teaching high school, I don't think I'd be a writer. I think I'd still be an, an inveterate reader, but I wouldn't be the writer that I am today. And uh, I needed people to tell me, keep, keep writing stories and sending them out and so on. Um, right. Yeah, well, I tell my students that every day, I either had the experience, sometimes I have both experiences in a single day, of seeing something happen in a story that's not quite working and then I'll think, oh my God, I just did that myself. Oh. Um, and then the other thing that happens, especially at Emerson where we've had some great students is that you see something you, just so extraordinary in a story that it's, it's one of those moments where you think this is when I do it. Um, you know, it's that level of excitement. Um, Audrey, while we've been here, my scrolling mouse has stopped. So I think I'm going to need you to come in and pose these questions 
um, from the audience, if you will, because I can't move through the, the list. No problem. We got a good number of them. You want to get started? Sure. Yeah. All right. We have a question that says, I love the story brochures and would um, this person would like to know um, if it was premeditated. Did I know how it was going to end? Oh, wow, that's interesting. It's interesting that, that the person asked about brochures just after I read Doors, because in Doors, there's a nasty man, point of view, and he gets killed by, by the wife. <laughs> and the, the thing, same thing happens in brochures. Um, I think I was writing, he was just a pissy person. And as I was writing it, I just allowed his wife to push him over a cliff. <laughs> Why am I laughing? <laughs> yeah, that was fun to, to write. <laughs> hey, if it's a good ending, it's a good ending. Uh, we have a question from Sue. She asks, how has your writing process changed if it has changed during the pandemic? And I think you could probably both talk about this. Mm, mine, I'm, I'm working on a longer story, which I'm in my fifth draft of. And then I'm also working on two or three little stories, flash stories. I teach a course in flash fiction. So I'm writing away. Um, I'm, I'm writing a story about that dog that barks in the night. <laughs> so, you know, ideas are just there. I'm, I'm writing. And Steve, where are you? Um, I finished a draft of a new novel back in April. And I had a lot of momentum built up. Um, when the pandemic started, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I, I got fairly depressed for a while. I still did my work, but I had to do a lot of rewriting of the last say, 75 pages of that novel this past fall. I finished, sent it off to Nigel and right before Thanksgiving. And I'm kind of on vacation now, but it can't last much longer because um, after two or three months of not writing, I start getting really crazy. So it, it's going to be time to go back to work before long. Good. We have a couple questions asking about endings. Um, you've mentioned a couple times tonight that you don't really know the ending when you start a story. How do you know when you're done and how do you know when you have a story's true ending? Oh, my endings, <clears throat> really, they're gifts from the gods. You just come to it and, and it's there. First of all, I have an unstable situation and I, I'm working through it. My characters are engaging each other. They're dealing with each other. They're dealing with the unstable situation. So I'm sort of solving that as I'm, as I'm writing through. But you know, when I started teaching in that course in high school, I, I taught from a book called Technique in Fiction by Macaulay and Lanning. And what it said was that you always have to know the ending of a story. Otherwise, how will you get there if you don't know it? Well, I, I got pregnant. I had three kids. I divorced my husband. And then I met the author, Roby Macaulay of Macaulay and Lanning. And you know how you have maybe uh, withheld information from, um, from new husbands and new lovers. Well, the thing I was withholding from my husband was I never knew my endings. And I thought, oh my God, he's written, you have to know, what is he going to think of me? He was astonished that I never knew where I was going. Anyway, Roby McCauley, a wonderful writer. So he married me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think well, it sounds more fun that way. I never know. I, I think I know basically how a novel or a story is going to end. But I have learned that if, if that never changes during the writing, that's the surest sign that I'm in trouble because I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. And um, for me, one of the joys, especially of writing novels is to get up expecting that I will discover something today that I didn't foresee. And that's what keeps me interested in the process. It's what keeps me interested in being alive, too. Oh, right. What's going to happen next in DC, right? Yeah. yeah but We're let's taking a break, break from that. Let's take a break from that. For the next 10 minutes, Delete. none of that. Okay. 
Um, we have a question from Sarah. She asks, or she says, you have such varied characters behaving in ways that feel wonderfully irrational and totally believable. Do you have craft advice for other writers on how you make your work feel both real and surprising? Oh, oh. I don't know. I think you have to kind of let your imagination go. Um, for example, you know, I took the idea that my cat wonders what's happening on the other side of the door and turned it into a story in which a man gets wiped out by his wife. And I, I wrote a story recently. I mean, you have to look at your habits too. Um, way when I was younger and all through college, to the astonishment of my roommates, I always looked under my bed before I got into bed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I was going to find anything there. I don't know why I did it. I was, I don't know, I'm always sort of afraid of the dark. Thank God. I think that's a wonderful attribute. But, um, oh, you just have to be open, open to anything, open to thinking about language. Like I, I also wrote a story about the word thoughtless. <laughs> Isn't that a funny word? Thoughtless, somebody doesn't have any thoughts. Also, a story about the words time being. I'm just gonna sit here for the time being. I mean, our cliches are just ripe for, uh, for, for playing around with. But, and I, I just find stories everywhere, really, yeah. <laughs> I love that. We have a question from Matt, he asks, have you ever, ever, either as an experiment or as an aspiring author, trying to flow of your own style, consciously written a story emulating another writer's style? Mm. Oh, you know, I don't think consciously emulating or trying to achieve another writer's style, but, um, and Margot and I have talked about this, one of the really great writers of all time is William Trevor. He, uh, he writes stories that are so, dark oh my god his mind must be i'm just filled with with amazing darkness i mean he's dead now of course he and and, and he did a an interview with the bbc one time and in the middle of the interview he started laughing and laughing and the interviewer said what are you laughing at and he said i don't know you don't <laughs> always have to know what you're laughing at <laughs> anyway, so so um, I I would love to think that I have some of his sense of mystery in his stories, and Alice Munro too. Some of the sense of her, oh my God, of her, uh, you know, the richness of a story that could be a novel, and and Margot Livesey has a novel that ends that that you don't know what's happened, what how it's ending until the last line. Yeah. I would be able to do something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Are you talking about um, the boy in the field? No, no, no. I well, think it's, I think it's a novel called Homework, but oh, I'm yeah. going toward that ending. And um, and I was reading a Chekhov story. I my everybody's read this: the lady and the pet dog, or the lady and the little dog. And I read that story, and I thought, oh my God, Alice Munro used that ending almost exactly. In, uh, in her story, Five Points, almost exactly, uh, where I, I think it ends something like there, she's having an affair with someone and, and she knows it's going to get difficult and she needs to tell him that up till now was easy, something like that. And that's exactly the Chekhov story. So um, I think we're all in a, a long line of, of who we've read. John Barth's the Fun House. Oh my God, he actually teaches a course in fiction, right, Steve? Yeah. When you're reading that, you're going along and reading the story and suddenly he'll say, okay, if you cross this detail and this detail, you get characterization. Um, yeah, I forgot what the question was, but clearly I, I could go on answering. <laughs> well, I would write a Trevor story if I could. I, I think I once wrote a Trevor paragraph, but that's as far as I could go. Steve, are there any other writers you've um, imitated their style before? Well, in my era in grad school in the 80s, this was the, the heyday of minimalism. And the writer, the two writers that almost all of us were imitating 
were Ryman Carver and Ann Beatty. Mm. Um, I think if you looked at some of those stories that we were all writing, you'd say, this is a contest for a bad, you know, like they had the bad Faulkner contest. We were having the bad Carver contest. Um, you know, I think we all imitate it one time or another, but hopefully we move away from it. You're reading, Wise words. Yeah, you're reading Faulkner now. You're reading through Faulkner. I mean, if there ever was a writer with cadences, is that catchy? Yeah, but if you're if you're a writer from the South like I am, you grow up, you know, the great line that Flannery O'Connor said, um, when the Dixie Special comes through, you get off the track. <laughs> and um, I, I think I maybe one of the things that saved me a little bit was that I understood that if my material was going to be similar to his, I really couldn't try to imitate that style because it, it belongs to one person. All right, I think we've got time for one, maybe two more. Um, this is a good one for both of you. Have you ever struggled with writer's block? And if so, how do you, how do you deal with it? Well, I think it's bullshit. <laughs> and uh, Norman Mailer, I mean, all these, all these people, you know, Alice Monroe and Trevor, Norman Mailer said, writer's block is merely a failure of ego. I just, I just don't believe it. And I don't ever come up with, with little sayings, except for this one. Discipline is a form of self-respect. So I've, I've just never had writer's block. I just, you, I just move through it. And uh, think of that, a failure of ego. Norma well, Mason had it, clearly. No, that's what I was going to observe. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I've learned that my process involves some downtime between books. And, you know, one of my very closest writer friends is the novelist and short story writer, Ron Rash. And I don't think Ron ever takes a day off because he, his process demands that he do it every day. That's what works for him. Mine demands that I do it every day when I'm doing it. Um, but as far as doing what, a, what Trollope allegedly did, which is finish one novel in the morning and start the other one in the afternoon, there's just not enough up here for me. I, <laughs> I think I'm, I've written the number I'm supposed to, or I will, whenever I'm done. You have an act, you write every day. I, I have to admit, I do not write every day, um, but I'm always, I always am working on two or three stories in my head, but um, I don't have, I don't have the discipline to work every day. I don't have, I guess, the inclination to work every day, but for a writer, your mind is always, always working. Well, I don't have the two or three stories in my mind. I'm lucky to think of one thing I could pull off at a time. Mm. Hey, if your process works for you, that's really all that matters. Right. All right. I have one more question for both of you. A bunch of people have asked it. What are you reading right now? Oh, I was reading Richard Powers' The Overstory. Um, I'm about ready to start that reading group, Anna Karenina. And uh, I'm always reading George Saunders' In and Out. And um, yeah, yeah, The Overstory. I, I thought it was like little stories for a while when I first started, but they just keep overlapping and overlapping. It is an astonishing book. And, you know, I think it was Charles Baxter who once said, it's hard to write a story from the point of view of someone who is much more intelligent than you. I think he said that in terms of writing first light. Anyway, I, I might be misquoting him at any rate. When I read Richard Powers' this overstory, I thought I will never be able to write at that level. Um, so anyway, yeah, we write where we are, but the overstory. Steve, what are you reading? Oh, Steve, yeah. Well, um, I'm rereading Parker's Collected Stories, and I read a story the other day called Dr. Martino that just blew me away, and I thought, I. I thought I had read all of Faulkner's stories at some point in the last 40 years. And then I thought, well, I don't remember this. I never read it. Well, 
I've been keeping reading journals for 40 years. And finally, I found that I had indeed read that story about 30 years ago, and I didn't remember it at all. I was, and it served as a great reminder that we are different people down the road. And um, clearly I was not somebody who could receive that story at that time. I'm also reading Heather Cox Richardson's because uh, she's had a major role in keeping me from losing my mind right. the last few years. Uh, I'm reading her book, How the South Won the Civil War. But I had to quit that the other day because it was having a bad effect on me. I'm going to come back to it and after the <laughs> inauguration. <laughs> Nothing wrong with self-care. Um, all right, you both. This has been lovely. I think that's all we have time for. Pam, Steve, this is so wonderful. This was so needed. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us tonight. And um, thank you to everyone at home who's tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and all our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. Check out the chat if you're interested in buying a copy of Fabrications. You won't regret it. And please remember to shop indie and shop local, practice self-care this weekend. From all of us at Harvard Bookstore, be well. Thank you, Audrey. Have Thank a great you. night. Thank you.